Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to June's podcast series on one month to better investigations and internal reportings. So what do you do when the call, the email, or the personal tip comes into your office where an employee reports suspicious activity somewhere literally across the globe? That activity might well turn into a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act issue for your company. In today's climate, it can turn into issues under lots of different anti-corruption jurisdictions. The Brazilian Clean Companies Act, the UK Bribery Act, or even domestic anti-corruption laws such as brought GSK to bear in China. As the Chief Compliance Officer, it will be up to you to begin the process which will determine in many instances how your company will respond going forward and will set the tone throughout this most difficult period. This month's podcast series will provide to you all the steps you need to consider going forward. I'm going to take a look at independent versus in-house investigations, investigation protocols, the different resources that a compliance practitioner may bring to bear in an investigation, such as internal audit, IT, and legal. And I'll take a look at special issues such as privilege, Upjohn and Miranda warnings, data privacy, and of course, the Yates memo and its effect. I think you will learn a lot this month if you follow this podcast series. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to the June podcast series. Day 12, the witness interview. What are the characteristics of a good interview in the context of an internal investigation? Is there one technique you can use which will provide you the results you want to achieve? How should you think through your questions and document review prior to the investigation? In this episode, I explore these questions and others in an interview with noted internal investigations expert Jonathan Marks, a partner at Markham LLP, for this piece. Marks began by making it clear there is no one right way to prepare for and conduct an interview. What is important is that you have a plan and execute on that plan. He said he begins by obtaining an understanding of what the various stakeholders want answers to in the interview and investigation process. These stakeholders could include the board of directors, C-suite members, the general counsel in the legal department, the chief compliance officer in the compliance function, or government regulators such as the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Justice Department. Marx feels it's a, it is important to interview witnesses as soon as you reasonably can do so to prevent multiple witnesses from getting together and coordinating their stories. You should recognize you are never going to have perfect information, so he believes it is more important that you should try and tie down the story. If a witness is not an English speaker, of course, you should have a translator present. You should also have a second person with you who notes, who takes notes so you can watch the witness's facial expressions and body language. There are a lot of situations where being an effective listener is much more critical than being an effective note taker. Listening to what the interview is, interviewee is saying when you ask them questions is critical because it sets everything up. Having somebody there to take notes gives you the opportunity to really focus on a couple of different things. In other words, verbal cues, such as body language, such as how they may look at you. It allows you to focus on not only what they're saying, but how they're saying, and sometimes what they're not saying. A note taker should be free from bias and subjectivity, simply taking down a detailed recitation of the witness testimony. Interestingly, Marx does not view his interviews as putting the witness in the box. He said it's important to establish a rapport with the witness so they will be more forthcoming in their responses. This is not a contentious exercise, and it's more about building rapport. If somebody feels uh, that you're cross-examining them, it's very structured and not free-flowing. They will not be uh, as willing to uh, share information with you. It is above all to garner an understanding of what facts the witness has, what the witness may be aware of, and determining what others, both inside and outside the organization, might not only 
have potential involvement with, but also know. You should really avoid leading questions, or excuse me, loaded questions like, why did you bribe the inspector? You really should try to nibble around and circle around to such point. He emphasized several times that any inquiry is a chess match, and you have to really work sometimes to get the information out. Also, uh, I would add, avoid compound questions. You should try and develop facts during the interview to get out exactly what happened, when it happened, where it happened, and who, was, who it happened with or to. <clears throat> you could also ask about who else might know other information, how all this happened, are there any notes or other documents that the witness has, phone messages, emails, or other types of evidence which support what they are saying. A lot of times, in an interview, if someone is willing to talk, they usually have something else they could provide. And of course, if you don't ask, you certainly won't get it. Marx believes it's a best practice to get down everything immediately. <clears throat> so he goes over um, the interview as soon as is is re as reasonably practical with his partner, um, making sure they both understood what was said and how it was said. Uh, if there was any observations he had that may not be in the write-up, he adds those. He believes this is important because the longer you wait, the more inaccurate your account of what happens becomes. Uh, so writing up your notes is critical. Once again, he emphasized, or Marx emphasized, this is really a chess match. When you're playing chess, you have to think a couple of moves ahead, if not three, four, or five. Um, you have to talk in and out. You have to use methods of conducting interviews where there are more than uh, several people who might have information, uh, all related to allegations. So you've really got to think through this. Marx also discussed some strategies around the interview process. The first is what he termed the inside-out strategy, which <clears throat> he advocated using if the allegations extend beyond the company that you are performing the internal investigation for. In this technique, you interview people inside the organization first, then maybe go to third parties. Uh, obviously, the converse would be an outside-in strategy, where you would interview people outside the organization first, and then move inside the company. Of course, you can do a combination of both. Another technique would be conducting concurrent interviews, and Marx advocates using this strategy if you think people are going to talk or you th uh, think there's potential collusion out there uh, and conducting simultaneous interviews uh, prevents those individuals from coordinating their story and collaborating their story uh, before they get to tell you. So what are today's three key takeaways? Well, the first is that there's no one right way to prepare for and do an interview. It's going to depend on a variety of factors, and here's where the professionalism and skill of the investigative team and the interviewer come into place. You're going to have a wide variety of documents. You're going to have a wide variety of uh, physical evidence. You're going to have a wide variety of witnesses, and uh, you may need to utilize uh, several of these investigative strategies that I've discussed in this podcast. Second, do not be confrontational. If you're confrontational, it's the surest way to get a witness to clam up. If you be collaborative and ask them to basically tell their story, most people want to tell their story. Oftentimes they will bring uh, documents or other evidence to back up their version of events. So try to be collaborative. Try to, uh, uh, Of course, you have your professional skepticism, but you do not have to be contentious and you do not have to be confrontational. And finally, the interview, like the entire investigative process, is a chess match. You always have to be thinking ahead. Simply because you can't get one question answered in a particular way, uh, you may have to go around and nibble around it several times from the sides, from the back, from the front. Uh, you may need to show a witness documents to refresh their recollection. You may need to ask them to show documents as to why something may or may not support their position. But it's always a chess match. You always have to be thinking ahead. And indeed, uh, just as the 
investigative process is a chess match. In many ways, the interview is also a chess match. So it's not that you have to outthink your opponent, but you certainly have to think several moves ahead. This is Tom Fox. I hope you have enjoyed day 12 of one month to better investigations and reporting, and I hope you'll join me tomorrow for day 13. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate the podcast as it would help in our rankings and also help get the word out about the only one-month podcast series to a better compliance program. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. You can reach me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much again for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for one month to better investigations and reporting.